Chapter 4. Part 4. Biological Constraints on Classical Conditioning. In Module 1, we discussed the general principle approach to learning. The idea behind the general principle approach is that although the procedural details will differ, the process of learning is conserved across species. What they learn is, of course, different, but no matter whether your research, research subjects are rats, pigeons, elephants, aplesia, or undergraduates, how they learn should be fundamentally the same. The experimenter's choice of stimuli, responses, and species of subject should be relatively important. Here are some results that challenge this notion for classical conditioning. One implication of the general principle approach to learning is the equipotentiality premise. Seligman and Hager proposed that a stimulus or response that is difficult to condition in one situation will also be difficult to condition in other contexts. Eye blink conditioning takes a long time compared to other types of conditioning, regardless whether the CS is a visual auditory or other stimulus. If it's difficult to condition a response to a soft sound or subtle change in lighting, that difficulty will occur no matter whether the US is a food, a shock, or something else. In an experiment involving both, both taste aversion learning and condition suppression, Garcia and Culling showed that the equipotentiality premise is wrong. Garcia and Culling used different CSs and different USs and exposed different groups of rats to different CS-US combinations. When the US was a mild shock, rats acquired strong conditioned responses to light and sounds, but only weak conditioned responses to the taste of saccharin. So far, this is okay. It could mean that the lights and sounds were more salient stimuli than the taste of saccharin. There's no violation of the equipotentiality premise just yet. Some rats in Garcia and Culling's experiment experienced taste aversion learning. They were exposed to the CS before consuming an emetic, so something that made them vomit. Now, with vomiting as the US, rats acquired strong conditioned responses to the saccharin and weak conditioned responses to the lights and sounds. The effectiveness of the stimuli as conditioned stimuli depended on the context in which they were conditioned or what they were conditioned to do, what they were signaling. Moreover, an effective stimulus for rats will not necessarily be an effective stimulus for birds in the same situation. So this uh, complete result from Garcia and Culling is certainly a violation of the equipotentiality premise. Does that mean that behavioral scientists should abandon the general principle approach to learning? Seligman didn't think so. He proposed instead that there are innate predispositions to some CS-US combinations that make them easier to learn than others. This idea uh, of biological preparedness or susceptibility to certain associations is appealing because it can explain just about any combinatorial or species difference, at least after it has been observed. But it would be better if it could make predictions about such differences beforehand. If the contiguity principle requires that the CS and US must be presented within seconds of each other for learning to occur, then taste aversion learning would seem to be a pretty extreme violation of it because it rarely happens within seconds and has been shown to occur in experiments after delays as long as 24 hours. In fact, for a while in the 1960s, there seemed to be a lot about taste aversion that didn't conform to expectations of contemporary learning theories. It seemed to occur with different stimuli, mostly worked with a very long delay, and there were species differences in the strength of different CS-US associations. All of this led some scientists to suggest that maybe taste aversion learning was just a different type of learning uh, than other classical conditioning. Fortunately, Lexa Loeb published a review of taste aversion learning research in the Psychological Bulletin in 1979 that got everyone to calm down. She pointed out that although these differences are quite real, they don't actually violate any principles of classical conditioning. Here's figure 4.8. In the top panel, the CS 
was a light and the US was a shock. The graph shows condition suppression of lever pressing for different CS US delays. In the bottom panel, the CS was a flavor and the US was a poison, so taste aversion conditioning. The graph shows condition suppression of drinking of the flavor for different CS US delays. These two graphs look pretty similar, except that the delays in the top panel are in seconds and the delays in the bottom panel are in hours. If the contiguity principle requires that the CS and the US must be presented within seconds of each other for learning to occur, taste aversion learning violates it. However, as long as you acknowledge the possibility that conditioning of different responses can occur on different timescales, there's no violation because the process is the same. The take home message here is that when you encounter something that looks like a violation of an established idea, it's important to think about what is the most straightforward explanation for it.